want the right one? Uh, no. Right. Actually, if you can think of the network. <laughs> the, the next speaker is Key Martin from the Naval Research Laboratory, who's going to be speaking on a domain theoretic model of qubit channels. How does that thing work, by the way? Do I just go? Yeah, you have to point it at. Okay, good. Oh, right, um, i got to wake up now. Great. So I, I, I've been starting my talks off with this. I just want to say to everyone, I'm looking for, you know, fun student research, various types, some postdocs, other forms of research and workshops and conferences. Um, I like domain theory a lot, but I'm open to all sorts of things, really. <laughs> This, this category sort of, you know, is a catch-all, right? I just put that in there. Um, so the, the overview of this talk goes like this. Um, in ICAL 2000, I, I wrote, like, one of the first papers on domains and measurements. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of that. Um, and then in 2004, I considered connections between domains and measurements and quantum information and information theory. It's a, it's a nice splash. <laughs> All right? This, I'm just messing with you. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about some new things, and then you're going to do it again. All right. Um, so first, um, the view in domain theory and measurement is, is that you have a qualitative idea about information, um, which is expressed by the order. Now, from the order of the information order, you derive, uh, you know, a, a subrelation, which is called approximation. All right. The information order means something like x carries information about y, and approximation means no, x actually carries essential information about y. Right? Um, one of the things we like most about it um, is that it gives us a way to understand the Scott topology. All right? the, the open sets in this topology are the set of things that are all approximated by some element of surrender by cameras. It's like I'm going to goddamn press conference. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, the quantitative view, which is what measurement um, introduces, it, is that you, you, every element actually has, you know, um, like an amount of information, okay? Um, and this is a hard idea to nail down, all right? But, you know, if, if you go here and you look at it, you go, well, you know, all right, you say this carries information about this, or this is essential information, well, you know, how much, right? Um, that's what this is for. Now, I'm going to sort of give you a vague description, because if you haven't seen it before, you can probably not going to get it in like the 30 seconds. I spend on the side. One, one property that measurements have, so this is an extended definition, right? One property they have is that they're monotone, all right, but in reverse order. So as you move up in the domain, the amount, you know, the, the uncertainty decreases, right? So the, the actual numbers get smaller, right? But that means you're gaining information. This is very much like, you know, um, like a topic idea here, right? It's also <coughs> continuous, which in this context just means this. You know, it commutes with the limit operator. Right? Um, now, so they're always not continuous, but they have this other property, which is just called the measurement property. And here's what it says, right? So let me, let me try to say it like this. Um, any, any approximation, u, of x, is also an approximation about the things which are epsilon close to x, right? And the catch is that when you say epsilon close, you're actually involving the measurement. Right? And that's what means you're measuring information content. It's not just got continuity. It's this extra thing. Now, actual measurements of properties are much stronger than this, but this, this is the minimal thing. Right? This could be a very hard condition to verify. Um, but recently, actually, me and him, um, we, we, we proved a theorem that actually makes it easy. So now it's actually an easy thing to verify. It's just for the first eight years it wasn't. <laughs> All right? um, so some examples really quick. Um, you know, if you look at the interval domain, right, the closed you know, bounded intervals, ordered by reverse inclusion, you've probably seen this length, all right, this is a measurement on the domain of intervals, right? There's a domain of binary channels, and, and on this domain, Shannon's capacity function, which is a monstrosity, right, is, is a measurement. Um, there's a domain of classical and quantum states, a couple actually, I'm, I'm going to show you some simple examples of those today, but entropy in, in both contexts is a measurement, and actually I, I put this one in here just to show you that, you know, they're very different things. Global time functions. <laughs> general relativity, which I know all of you are dying to hear about. <laughs> um, these also define measurements on the domain of space time interval, so it, 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 it arises in many contexts. Um, some of the properties that you can derive right, from the measurement property itself, um, which is masks pretty well, right? if an element has measure zero, then it actually has to be maximal in the information order. Right? So that says like, if some object has no uncertainty, then you can't improve it, you know, which makes sense. 
Um, this one, if you have comparable objects with the same content, they're equal. You see what I mean? Uh, you kind of did it right once they equal. That was good. Um, and then, and then this last property, you know, pretty much confirms what we already thought, right? Um, you can use the measurement in the order to recover the Scott topology. I mean, um, but the importance of these properties is always immediately apparent. But this one right here, all right, comparable objects with the same content equal strict monotonicity. It actually lets you define a derivative, all right? So, so any process you can represent is some kind of function on a domain, and it doesn't have to be from D to B, it could be from D to E, but you can assign it an informatic derivative, and this is what it what it says, right? It's very much like f of x minus f of p over x minus p, right? And it's supposed to look like that. There's a reason, right? The basic idea is that, you know, mu is like a variable on a domain. You see, domains don't have variables on their own, so you give them one, and then you can do calculus, right? Um, and so it, it does generalize the classical derivative. And one way to do that is you, you take an ordinary function from the reals to reals, you extend it to the interval domain, and then this <coughs> extension has an informatic derivative with respect to length, and that is the normal derivative, you know, like made positive, right? All right. Um, but it also has, there are also many, many things that have derivatives that are not um, classical in any sense of the word, right? Because any function with a fixed point on a domain, which is one of the reasons we like domain theory, right? There are functions with fixed points, we calculate things. Um, has, it, you know, you can, you can measure the rate at which a function converges to a fixed point, right? So you, maybe you're familiar with least fixed points. You begin at bottom, you iterate to a fixed point, but you can ask, well, how quickly does this function converge to a fixed point? That's what this measures. You can prove this. Um, so now we're going to look at two examples of domains in detail, because that's really what this talk is about. And they're two very simple examples. So that, the first one is this, right? This, this is a set of, of, what would you call this? I mean, finite probability distributions over a two element set, right? Now, I actually believe that this is a very important object, and that uh, the more we learn about it, we're going to see it's, you know, really sort of fundamental. Um, we have some theorems to, to that effect, by the way. Um, but anyway, one of these, these, you know, pairs of probabilities that sum to one, right? So you have some experiment where one of two things can happen, and these give you the probabilities of the outcome. You can order them this way, right? So let me show you a picture. Um, because, you know, oh, wait a minute. No. All right. They form a line, right? No, normally. See? So you take the line and you bend it. And so down here is one half, one half, and up here is one zero, and up here is zero, one. You see? Um, and that's how you order them. So you're moving up. You see? So this is the one that's most uncertain, right? And then as you move up, uncertainty, you know, decreases. See? Until you have these two maximal elements, which are different things. That's, so they're only around branches. Um, so we have a domain, right? And entropy is a measurement. You, you can see it, it's, all, it's practically, you know, an isomorphism, right? Actually, it is. Um, all right. So in the quantum case, um, the same thing, right? We think of probability distributions, but instead of over a two element set, you know, over, over a, a two dimensional you know, it's a set of two-dimensional quantum states, right? Now, so those are complicated, all right? They, they're things called density operators, but we're going to get around all this by using a trick, right? And so the trick is this. The, the two-dimensional quantum states, all right, are isomorphic points in the unit ball, right? You, you, can, you can show this. I included this just in case you were wondering. So what happens is all, all two-by-two two complex matrices arise. You, you know, the set of two-by-two two matrices is... Vector space, right? It's got a basis, the poly operators. So you can write them in any matrix can be written as, you know, C1 times this, C2 times that, plus C3, C4, right? But in the case you're actually talking about a quantum state, it turns out that the first coefficient is always a half, and these things are real, and they give you a point on the unit ball. So on the on the surface or inside is what I mean. Okay. Um, and and so this is an isomorphism. When I say isomorphism, I mean it's a convex linear map with a lot of other really nice properties, right? So if we want, we don't have to actually mention this at all, but I included it in case you were wondering, hey, what about Hilbert space? But we don't need Hilbert space to do this, <laughs> right? That's my point. So, so see, though, you know, those are the density operators, but that's really what it is, the unit ball, right? So now if I, I think about ordering quantum states, it's easier. I can do it like this, right? And what does this say? This says x is below y if the line from the center of the sphere to y passes through x, right? That's the easiest picture in the world to imagine, right? 
Um, and again, you know, it's not a surprise. You get a domain where entropy is a measurement. And I've written entropy here in the, the traditional way and in the block way, just so you can see. Right? I mean, so, um, those are our, so those are our domains, right? And now, what, what does a channel do? A channel operates on states, right? So a classical channel operates on classical states. A quantum channel operates on quantum states. And in, in the case of a classical channel, right, you're going to get a convex linear operator, you see, from states to states, right? And it looks like this. You know. um, and we can ask, does it have any domain theoretic structure? See, the states do, but do the channels. It's functions, right? If you ask the same question about quantum channels, Right? If you take any quantum channel at all, it can be assumed to be an affine mapping. It takes a sphere to the sphere, right? Or you know, inside the ball. Right? Um, I mean, one way to think about it is this. It makes this diagram. Right? And again, does it have any domain theoretic structure? Same, same question. Um, now, in domain theory, a natural form of structure for a function to have is that it be stop continuous. Right? We like stop continuous maps because they have least fixed points. You know? um, and, and I wrote here the topological version, but now I realize probably most of you probably know this, but I'll just write it anyway. What does it mean to be stop continuous? So it means it means that you're that you're monotone, right? And it means that you preserve limits. So you see every the soup of the directed set is just it's a limit, right? And so you're just saying you know, if you apply the function to the limit, that's the same as taking the limit of the function values, right? You want this, and you want it to be monotone just in advance, right? Um, so that's what it means to be stop continuous. And they always have least fixed points. And, and the way you get the least fixed point, right, is you begin at bottom, and then you just keep applying the function, right? And then you take the limit, and that's a fixed point. Um, it's a fascinating thing. Because a domain in stock topology is an example of a fixed point space, a space with the fixed point property, but it's not Hausdorff, right? And there's a lot of other properties that are very interesting. Um, so now, if we go to information theory, right? What's a natural like? What's a natural model of noise? And it's the entropy increasing channel, right? In in, in classical information theory, you understand these to be binary symmetric, right? These are channels that don't distinguish between zero and one. If you send something through, it get, it'll get flipped with the same probability, right? So there's no bias in the noise. It's, it's always an assumption you make when you don't know things, right? Um, in the quantum case, a channel is entropy increasing when it actually maps the center of the sphere to the center of the sphere. See? Um, so we, we have this natural idea in the main theory, it's got continuity. We have this natural idea in classical and quantum information theory. Um, and it turns out, that these two are both the same exact domain theoretic idea, even though it's not maybe immediately apparent. Right? Um, so this is the first theorem. That the first theorem is that a classical channel is binary symmetric if it's got continuous, right? And instead of fixed points, it's got closed. See? And that's equivalent to being a binary symmetric channel. So that's equivalent to being an entropy increasing channel. But the second part is that a quantum channel is, is what this is called unital, right? If it's got continuous and instead of fixed points, it's got closed. See, see, here's the thing, right? You're probably thinking, or maybe you're not actually, but, but, but there's a chance you could be thinking, well, all you know, I thought the set of fixed points was always closed, right? Right? That's true in a Hausdorff space, right? In a space where you can separate points with disjoint open sets. In this space, you can't separate points, right? So it actually means something that the set of fixed points is got closed, right? And, and what it turns out to mean is. You're a channel that increases entropy if you set a fixed point to Scott's laws, right? Um, which is strange, but the thing is, this is actually an indication of something deeper going on. So, so I mentioned before that this order is unique. Here's one way it's unique, right? There's a unique partial order on that on that thing that has these two properties. Its least element is bottom, right? And it satisfies the mixing law, which says that if S is more informative than R, then any mixture of the two it's more informative than R and less informative than S, right? It's a, it's a, natural, it's a natural property. Um, now, so let's look at it this way. Suppose we began with a partial order on this set, and we, we assumed it had these two properties. Then what do we know, right? Well, well then we know that if that happened, it would, it, a consequence would be that the entropy increase in channel would all be stock continuous and have a closed set of fixed points, right? So my point is, 
you know, many of these two, there's this consequence it has, right? That tells you something about entropy increasing channels. And in the quantum case, that's how we can actually prove that the spectral order is, is the unique way to order two-dimensional mixed states, right? So there's only one partial order on a set of mixed states that has three properties. So the three properties, and, you, and this is in full generality, um, you know, that's its least element, right? Which is the completely mixed state. It satisfies the mixing law, same exact thing. As a matter of fact, I cut and pasted this from the last slide. <laughs> and the third thing is that every unit channel, so every increasing, entropy increasing channel is monotone, and it has a lower set of fixed points. So this sounds a little bit weaker, but it's not, right? I mean, you get the, 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 the continuity more free. Yeah. Um, so then it has to be the spectral order. So there's only, there's only one order on two-dimensional mixed states that'll do those three things, right? And that's the one we wrote down. Right? So this, this theorem holds in the classical the quantum case. And what, what's interesting about it is, and, and this is a, there's a subtlety here, but knowing that the order is like this, right? So knowing that a unital channel is actually stop continuous um, will actually give you a way to calculate the Halevo capacity. So this is what it is. You know, it's intended to sort of be the quantum analog of, of the classical idea. Right? I mean, it very much looks like that, right? It looks like you're souping mutual information. It's sort of what it looks like, right? Except you, you replace, you know, classical entropy with quantum entropy. And you have convex sums here and overall ensembles. And, and, and you know, so this is, uh, there's like a textbook, like, like Nielsen uh, and Schwang's textbook. And they, they introduce this idea and, they, and then they calculate it in this one case, right? In the case of a depolarizing channel. Um, and, you know, and if you look into it, you start to realize, like, why? Because, I mean, look at that, right? That's, you know, it's a nightmare, right? You know. Um, and so we're gonna sh I'm going to show you how to calculate this for a unital channel, right? Um, and here it is. Um, remember I mentioned an informatic derivative earlier, right? Well, it turns out that not only are all unital channels Scott continuous, right? And their fixed points have all this nice structure, but they all have informatic derivatives at all points except the center, because you can't take the derivative at the center because you can't approach it from below in a non-trivial way. Um, and if you find the largest value of this informatic derivative, then that actually is the Halevo capacity. See? So this is much simpler, right? So you know, what do you do? You, you take the channel, find the largest value of its derivative, which we know exists, right? And then you plug it in here, right? And so to just give you an example, if the unital channel is actually symmetric, which in practice they, they all are, basically, um, you know, like if you have any convex sum of poly channels, right, they're always going to be symmetric. Um, well, then it reduces to this, right? So, so a unital channel, it really is just a three by three real matrix. If it's symmetric, which they usually are, you find its eigenvalue, right? The one with largest magnitude, which is usually easy to do. I mean, you can always do it in principle if you're solving a cubic equation. But I mean, when you have actual examples, you, you, you usually have a really easy way to diagonalize it. You know, you find it right away. Then you plug it in here, and it's that, right? So, so, so you can use this to calculate lots of things now, right? Like more than just the one example that we all know. As a matter of fact, one of the things it shows, by the way, is that there's something wrong with this view of capacity. And let me show you what I mean. Like, if you take any, any rotation, right? So I mean a three-by-three three real matrix that's orthogonal and has a positive determinant, right? That represents, you know, in quantum land, conjugation by a unitary, all right? And they're basically equivalent in this particular case, right? Well, we'll calculate this. This is easy, all right? Because if you take in the action of any unitary, this thing's always going to be one, right? Because it induces a rotation of the sphere. So if that thing's always one, then this is always a half plus half plus one. The entropy of one is zero, right? And it tells you that any rotation has a capacity of one which is its maximum value, right? You see, see, that doesn't make sense, right? If you think about it, there, there's, you know, I mean, why does it make sense? Okay, so here's what it means in principle. It means in principle you could take information, represent it in a basis, right? And then the person who receives it, if they happen to know some other magical basis and they measure in it, then they can get this information, right? There is such a basis, yes, but would two parties discover this if they were operating in an unknown environment? You know, I'm guessing the answer is no. You see what I mean? So from a realistic perspective, it's not good to say that capacity is one. You know, um, but anyway, we know this now because we can actually calculate it. 
So, um, yeah, I could rant about that for a while, so I won't. Um, so anyway, um, so what we learned is that, the, you know, well, that the fixed points in a topological structure, right, have significance that, well, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, it's, it's strange. It, I mean, it's strange to see, you know, a connection between, like, the set of fixed points being closed, right, and a channel being entropy increasing. I mean, it's, you know, I don't really know how to explain it except to prove the theorem we built here. Um, and then the other thing, though, which I'm very happy about, is that we've known for a long time that the informatic derivative, you know, can measure the rate at which you converge to a fixed point. You know, it extends the classical derivative and, you know, all things that are, like, just grounded in a rate of change idea, right? But in this case, you know, we're measuring something, like, really different, you know? I mean, it's true you can think of capacity as a rate or whatever, but the, the application is just, like, very, very different, you know? So, so we've learned that it can do something we didn't know it could do before. Okay, I'm finished. Time for questions? Yes. Key, how much is a chance to lift uh, below two dimensional case, like four dimensional two qubit channel? There's a good chance. So, so it doesn't completely depend on full domain theory structure then? It, um, I, I, th I, think, I think you could, but like actually, I think there are other hurdles first. You know, like there are things like, you know, like understanding the block representation higher dimensions, which I don't think is an easy problem, you know, I mean, because you can write out, oh, well, all right, we can think of every density operator as a classical state or some other stuff, but, but manipulating it is not as easy, you know, so, I mean, I think, I think that's the first step before, you know, you know what I mean, but I do think, well, I guess the basic point I'm making is that I think, I think there's a theorem somewhere, right, that says the order is, you know, there's only one order that will make the unitals act this way, and a bunch of other, you know, I mean, you might need an extra thing. But it's a strong property. You know, like when you constrain channels to be very, like, you know, specific. How about other types of channels? Oh, you mean, you mean not unital? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so there's an example amplitude damping. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a famous effect, right? So, amplitude damping is not unital, right? And you can prove it's not Scott continuous, right? So it's really, there really is something about, like, you know, some relation between the order and entropy increasing and everything. Um, but what amplitude damping it does, see, all unital channels, they take the sphere, right? And, it, and whatever they do, the center point never moves. Do you see what I mean? So maybe the sphere gets shrunk into a smaller sphere. Or maybe it gets deformed into a ellipse or something. But the point is the center is always there, right? But in amplitude damping, the entire ball just moves up to, like, a little thing up at the north pole. And, and so anyway, I'm, we've been studying non unitals So there are a lot of questions about non unitals channels. So one's really easy. Like, state a theorem which says, you know, um, I have a, you know, I have a qubit channel in general if I have a matrix and a constant that satisfies this. But the question is, like, well, what's the matrix, what's the constant, right? There's no easy answer to that. I mean, there, there's, like, random nonsense you can write down that's very complicated. So anyway, that would be the first question um, that I would think about those. But anyway, we've been studying those, and their properties are very, very different. So a, a simple illustration is this. Um, if, you, if you take bits and you represent them in some basis, and then you send them through a, a unital channel, then the receiver receives them in measures, right? Um, that defines a classical channel, okay? What kind? Well, you can show it's always a binary symmetric channel. Right? And so if you think of the binary symmetric channels as, as being the unit square, right? So the whole unit, because that's what they are, really, right? So you only need two probabilities to find a binary channel, right? Right, so now you choose any basis to communicate it, right? Well, if the information is passing through a unital channel, all, all you ever generate are, are binary symmetric channels. So all you ever get is just some channel along this line, right? Now... If you go to a non-unital channel, like amplitude damping, like me and my interns have this conjecture, which is backed up by lots and lots of graphs, right? <laughs> but we don't have a proof. But, but what you actually get is you get everything. Any, any binary channel arrives. So that's how different they are, is the point I'm making. They're really, really different and, and not well understood, really. Yeah. Any more?
questions? Well, in that case, let's thank you again.